Well, it's Tuesday. It is and, already. And we've got something really different. We always do different, but this is this is left field, I think, kind of thing. And we're still doing brass engines. Don't get us wrong here. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I want to show you something that, uh, at first glance, is is not that remarkable. It's a Union Pacific Centipede Tender. Wow. And um, the least remarkable thing about it is that I built it. You did? I did. Oh, my. In uh, the 1970s, as I recall. Really? Yeah. Now, it was a, a kit. Mm. A kit by Chemtron. Okay. Okay, what in the world is Chemtron? Yeah, it sounds like something you clean the house electronically. So now we have some history. We have to go back to uh, 1903. Wow. And I don't know the guy's real name. A.F. Kemalayan hmm. formed an engraving company in Los Angeles. What is an engraving company? Well, um, they would do photo etched engraving in brass, zinc, different materials. And uh, the way that would work is they would do artwork and sometimes they do separations for a newspaper or something else. But I think probably they were doing uh, stuff for the printing industry, probably mm. a lot. I don't know, but it was brass engraving. Wow. Uh, where you would take photographic material, they'd put a blue uh, protective coating on a sheet of brass, um, expose that to a negative, uh, develop that, and that would cause uh, open areas in the blue mask, which would allow acid when you put it in an acid bath, the acid to go through the open areas and etch the brass. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's how the sides of this were made. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So they took, um, they put a blue etchant on a brass sheet, and then they exposed that through a negative and developed that, and then they put it in, in acid, and that etched all of the rivet detail My on goodness. here. wow. Well, that's not what they were doing in 1903. No, I wouldn't think so. They didn't start doing that until 1948-ish, 1948, and the company opened as Chemtron, oh. this time Levon Camelian, uh -huh. uh, and he was related to AF Camelian, but I don't know exactly, not a direct descendant and he had huh. to buy the company with his brother-in-law and oh, I don't, one of those one of those weird mm -hmm. things but they bought out the company because he wanted to make these oh he didn't want to do the brass etching that they'd already been doing he wanted to make brass engines neat and part of the process for making brass engines is the photo etching of the sheets and when I bought this it was just flat sheets ah Kind of like some kind of, of like the, uh, my metal earth. <laughs> your metal earth, yeah, exactly. Oh, and man. then I had to take a piece of wood and carve it with the rounded shape, and then wrap the brass around that, and then solder the whole thing together. But almost everything that you're seeing here is made out of photo etched oh, that is brass incredible. sheet. Huh. And when you look at most, um, especially diesel brass engines the body work and, and a lot of that sort of stuff, that's how it's made. It's hmm. made out of photo etched, you know, sheet. Right. These days that's been somewhat replaced by laser. It's been almost entirely replaced by laser cutting. Yeah. But there's still people doing photo etching until fairly recently that's how, oh, that's how cool. brass engines were made. Hmm. Now there is the, uh, let me show you. I, I have one of those negatives. Oh, holy so, cow. So uh, this has a, an engine on it. This, this came from Jack Douglas. But you can see um, the, the artwork has to be full size um, because what they do is they would make the artwork by drawing it out or photographing and then pen and ink and however. And then using a copy camera, they would turn it into one of these. And then these would actually be placed in contact with the metal sheet. So they might have 30 locomotive sides Goodness. that would all print, you know, onto a sheet of brass this big, and then that would go into the acid. Then they'd have another one of these for the other side that would do the same thing. And then when they threw it in the acid, that side would be allowed to eat all the way through, and that would break the parts into the individual oh pieces. Oh, my. Wow. Okay, so this is a, a major piece of, of how a brass engine was made. 
and then a lot of those pieces would be sent off to Japan. Usually this kind of work was done here in the States and then mm -hmm. the assembly was, was done in Japan. In Japan. Hmm. Now the other part of this and the other part of brass engines uh, that, you, that you have to make are the, the castings. The, in this case, the, the side frames uh, for the centipede parts and the wheel truck in uh, uh, the frame. And it depends on the brass model. A lot of these brass models will be almost entirely castings. Mm. And then um, those castings are soldered together the same way. And then other parts will be done this way, the way that these tender sides were done. Mm. And the, the brass castings are made by a, a, a machinist capable of doing incredibly small work. And then those are pressed into these rubber molds Oops, oh, oh. that one's going to come apart on, on me. On the loose! This one actually makes a player piano. Um, but some of these that are in here make uh, locomotive bits and pieces. Huh. That's a, a coupler pocket. Oh, neat. And then once you have your, your wax mold for making the little tiny part, this is put into a wax injector and hot molten wax is oh. shot into there. And then when you open it, you now have wax pieces. Art. And then those are put into uh, a hard plaster-like material, uh, investment, crystobolite, hmm. whatever. Sort of like they make rings. The exact same process. Mm. I mean, this process has been around forever for jewelry making. Right. And it was sort of usurped by the brass engine people. Mm. And this kind of stuff, uh, Ralph just showed me an engine. You know, he's got the first mass produced brass engine. Ralph's collection. Yeah. Is no it. kidding. And it dates back to uh, the late 1940s, 1950s, somewhere Goodness. in the same era as, as this guy that one. here. Um, when the kit came out, I didn't build it then, of course. But that's when, the, <laughs> that's when Chemtron started making these kinds of things. But um, uh, he, he's found a brass engine. It's one of the very earliest brass engines, all made in the United States. It's before anything was sent to Japan because it was this thing in the way of World War II. Mm -hmm. But this dates uh, from 1938. Oh, okay. A brass engine from 1938. So the the brass engine idea had been around for quite some time, but mm. it sort of exploded on the market around like 1950, which is when Chemtron hit mm -hmm. the market. And they, they kits only. I don't think they made, they may have made, but I've never heard of it, an assembled engine. Mm -hmm. And I built several of their kits. I built uh, an 060T mm -hmm. uh, in O scale. And that was one of the neat things with this. They could change the scale just by zooming the camera out. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, you just need to take the whole model and make it bigger, move the camera back a little, mm. and, and then etch your parts, and they're just <laughs> going to come out bigger. So it was very easy for them to make these things in both O and HO, and, and principally those were the only scales back then. Wow. Isn't that something? That's crazy. It's weird, and it's weird, and it's wild, and it's wonderful. <laughs> My goal in building this is I was going to build an entire big boy. Oh. Because a company called Bowser... Uh, made a Zymac Big Boy that came with no details at all. And I was going to buy one of those kits, and then I was going to combine it with this tender, oh. and then buy all the brass castings. Well, I bought all the brass castings for detailing the Bowser kit, which I still have. Mm -hmm. I just never found a Bowser kit. Hmm. But there again, Ralph found, <laughs> found the kit. <laughs> of course. And he found one of these kits. And, he, and, and the kit that he had had all the brass castings and everything, so he handed the whole thing off to his son, who's not exactly a young son anymore, but he handed the whole thing <laughs> off to his son and said, see what you can do with this. And his uh, son brought it back, and he's turned it into a Challenger and numbered oh it 3985, and it is one of the most beautiful models oh I've my. ever seen. But it's, it's, it's the same tender. Neat. Because it's the Union Pacific. Yeah, anyway. That is awesome. That's a long story. But it's it's a, but it's a really interesting piece of how brass engines came into existence and in one of the earliest earliest companies. Now, as far as I know, Precision Scale, uh, which went out of business around 1970, uh, was acquired. Chemtron, I'm sorry, 
uh, which went out of business around 1970, was acquired by Precision Scale or oh. became Precision Scale. And Precision Scale has changed hands a few times, and now it's been bought out by Tomar. Oh, really? And Tomar also bought out all of Ralph's business because Ralph was in the business of making brass detail parts and trains and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, Tomar, and but Tomar hasn't put any of this stuff on the market because no sooner did they get everything organized and COVID hit. Oh, right. And they just locked the door oh, because they don't they not want to deal with that. So that will be along at some point in time. I but Tomar so. is going to be bringing back precision scale and I'm pretty sure precision scale, uh, with, but the, the Chemtron kits per se with the photo etching haven't been on the market forever, mm -hmm. and uh, but you can't find them all over eBay because um, I th I think I read that uh, at the height of of their business, Chemtron was producing sixty thousand kits a year Gee. for these various brass engines. Sixty thousand. So they're out there, and you Somewhere. can you can yeah. find them. And oh my gosh, these are fun to build. I, I had imagine. the best time building this little guy, and it actually builds out into a a fairly decent. A uh, little tender, even though all I have is the tender. Oh. <laughs> it's neat. It's neat. Yeah. It's neat. Anyway, long story, and I'm not making a long story short. I'm not going to say long story short. Long story long. There it is. There it is. The, oh, man. The, the Chemtron Centipede Tender. That's awesome. From roughly uh, 1950. Wow. Sli slightly older than me. Except that I built the kit. It with The kit, however, dates from. 1950. Well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, if you uh, if you haven't been over the channel, pop over the channel, and if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. And the easy way to pop over and subscribe <laughs> is the blue button. The blue Are we button ready? Over here. Zoink. <laughs> blue button. Well, we're not sure how you found this movie on the internet, and we hope you didn't find it boring because it's kind of long. And we will see you <laughs> on Sunday. Because we're going out to Ely, Nevada. We are. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> See, See you then. Bye-bye.